in sombre hours, when awareness of my own futility bursts in upon me, when all musical idioms, classical, exotic, ancient, modern and ultramodern, appear hollow and no more than the admirable result of diligent research without any ultimate justification, what is left but to retrace the true contour of music, forgotten somewhere in the forest, in the fields, in the mountains, on the seashore, among the birds. Olivier Messiaen's words, written in 1959, proclaim his distance from all musical traditions and his search for something encompassing, transcendental. An eclectic, a reformer, above all an individualist, Messiaen, born in Avignon in 1908, occupies a unique position in the musical pantheon of the 20th century. He has absorbed and employed with virtuosity many of the revolutionary techniques of contemporary European music. He has also looked beyond Europe and assimilated into his music the treasure house of Eastern, especially Hindu, rhythms. He is the first musician in history to have made a detailed inventory of the bird song of several continents and to have elaborated this song in musical structures of extraordinary complexity. These discoveries and his striking technical innovations are at the service of very personal aesthetic concerns. Messiaen is a visionary. His music is a striving to give concrete formal expression to a transcendental vision. This makes him the antipode of those composers of our time, such as Igor Stravinsky and his own pupil, Yanis Xenakis, who, following Eduard Hanslick's definition of music as tonally moving forms, think of music as referring to nothing but itself. Messiaen's music, as he has repeatedly insisted, expresses ideas, very specific, extra-musical ideas. His central preoccupations, he has said, are a profound concern with nature, a sensitivity to the mystery of love, and, supremely, adherence to the truths of the Catholic faith. Messiaen has fused these basic themes of Christian Europe in a highly individual way. His music, he insists, is theological, not mystical. Yet his special sense of the mysteries of love and the potency of nature makes his theological vision a peculiarly sensual one. The result is something quite unprecedented in European music. Since 1931, Messiaen has been the organist at the Church of the Sainte Trinité in Paris. But none of the great volume of organ music he has composed owes anything to traditional European liturgical forms. His evocation of nature, too, is far removed from anything hitherto attempted, from the romantic nature painting of German music of the 19th century and from the sensory impressionism of Debussy. For Messiaen, Nature is a manifestation of God. It can be apprehended, but not depicted.
to express his vision of the divine, Messiaen has created a unique musical language. Though its sources are multifarious, it is cogent and utterly original. Features of this language, notably its rhythmic structures, have had considerable impact on European musical thought since the Second World War. Messiaen taught and inspired an entire generation. His class in analysis at the Paris Conservatoire, of which the young Pierre Boulez was a member, had a literally epoch-making effect. Both Karl-Heinz Stockhausen and Yanis Xenakis received a decisive impulse from him. Messiaen's impact on musical thinking after the Second World War was due not primarily to his personal aesthetic, which was and has remained unique, but rather to the extraordinary innovativeness of his compositional procedures. His early successes in moving European music away from its central preoccupation with harmony by putting rhythm and timbre in the foreground opened up possibilities of fundamentally new modes of musical thought and experience in Europe. Looking back nearly 50 years, his erstwhile student, Pierre Boulez, recalls... In the rhythmical aspect, under the rhythmical aspect, then La Somini was very innovative, because first, his culture went beyond uh, the uh, normal rhythmical culture. He was very interested first in the old Greek meters. He revived them very intelligently, and also he was involved with revival, with not revival, but the adoption of uh, rhythm, all the rhythmical structure of the Indian music, which was absolutely unknown uh, until uh, what he did. And then also, uh, I think, as I mean, he thought in more, more and more in abstract terms. And I think, uh, you know, the most interesting thing that since the Middle Ages, there was not the kind of thinking like that. When the notes, the pitches, are not coming first, but first comes the rhythmical structure. And you find that in the music of the 14th century, of the 15th century, and until Messiaen, maybe in the, uh, still in the music of the 16th century, rarely, but I mean, after that, 18, 19, uh, there is, was nothing of this kind. And uh, even if in his early works, like the poem Pour Me, uh, it begins, for instance, with a rhythmical canon, uh, which is really conceived independently, and after you have to put clothes on that, and harmonic clothes, I would like to say. His uh, great achievement was to um, to make bigger conceptions about the rhythmical values of the music, about the rhythmical value even of the music, and uh, it was never so strong before. Because, for instance, the Viennese school uh, is always attached uh, to the traditional meter, and uh, of course you have this, some exceptions of uh, Berg, especially with the monorhythmica, which he used in Wozzeck or in Lulu, or uh, in the Kama concert. But, uh, I mean, there was just one feature. But uh, with Messiaen, he reorganized the rhythmical thinking. And I think, as I mean, it's a big achievement. There is a feature of Messiaen's work that is an extension, or rather a radicalization, of a technique pioneered by Stravinsky. I mean the tendency to compose not in a linear way, but in blocks of sound. Yes, you are uh, absolutely right. There is no development. I like the, the, the German word for that, Durchführung. Uh, you go through something. You are led through something. And uh, I think that uh, uh, Messiaen has not at all uh, feeling for that. I think for, for him, uh, there, are, there is no combination. He presents one idea. He develops uh, the ideas, but they remain absolutely homogeneous and they are not confronted to each other. As I mean, you see, if you refer to the very classical example of Beethoven, you, know, you have a first idea and the second idea, and you have a combination or a fight between the two. There is never a fight or a combination in the music of Messiaen. That's always just, I develop my idea. That's, he, he calls that in Stravinsky, when he, for instance, analyzed the Rite of Spring, he calls that uh, rhythmical characters, an individual, and they are individuals side by side. 
Monsieur Boulez, you will remember that Messiaen once wrote, Rhythmic techniques and rediscovered inspiration thanks to the song of birds. That is my musical life. It's almost as though there is a dependence on bird song as musical substance. Oh, very much uh, so and more and more. Um, certainly, also, I mean, if you see the early works, there is practically none. And it began uh, certainly with the Quatuor pour la fin du temps. And uh, after that, I mean, you find some bird songs in uh, the other works of the 40s, but I mean, that began, began really in the, in the 50s. And I think, maybe that's the wrong explanation, I don't know what the explanation I give. The more and more he had difficulties with his own harmonic language, uh, the more and more he tried to find in nature a kind of model which could compensate the loss of this coherent harmonic language. And that's not just an imitation, I think. That's a kind of, uh, of uh, way of building up a vocabulary. Monsieur Boulez, the first work in our programme, Oiseaux Exotiques, was commissioned by you for your Domaine Musical concerts at the Petit Théâtre Marigny in Paris and first performed there on March the 10th, 1956. How did the work appear to you then? In a very funny way, I was much more critical of this work than I am now. Uh, because I see, uh, you know, the freedom of, uh, of this work, the freedom of the language, the freedom of the material, and uh, that's, uh, uh, for me, a foreword uh, to, to chronochromy. Because uh, still, the vocabulary is much more simple. Uh, you have not this kind of speculative aspect of the, of the rhythm, for instance. Uh, the rhythm is contained with the percussion in Oiseau Exotique, and all the rest is bird songs and combination. And uh, the, uh, also uh, the um, form is a kind of continuous form, which is also a development, but of an academic form in, in itself. And for me, uh, what we call in French, uh, was exotic is a kind of galop d'essai, as I mean, like uh, horses which are training for the main uh, race. The work is scored for piano and small orchestra. In it, Messiaen cites 47 birds from India, China, Malaysia, and from North and South America. Some, of course, figure more prominently than others. Their song is represented in many different ways and in the most diverse orchestrations, as the following examples show. The white-crested laughing thrush of the Himalayas with its implacable bursts of sound requires the whole ensemble. The song of the wood thrush plays an important role in the piano part. In concerted passages, several birds sing simultaneously. The lesser green leaf bird is represented by the piccolo. At the same time, the Baltimore Oriole sings on flute, oboe and two clarinets. The red-billed Mesia is heard on the glockenspiel. And the California Thrasher on the xylophone. The result is a dense polyphony.
Chronochromie, Color of Time, was commissioned for the Donau Eschingen Music Festival in Germany and was first performed there in 1960 under Hans Rosbard. Does the work, Monsieur Boulez, have a special place in Messiaen's oeuvre? Certainly a place, definitely, uh, which puts it apart from the other works of Messiaen because, as you have noticed, certainly, there is no piano in it. And in all the other works of Messiaen for big orchestra or small combination with the Oiseau Exotic, there is always a very important piano part and with a lot of cadenzas, very brilliant uh, cadenzas. And I think also, I mean, it is part of uh, his inspiration to, to have the piano sound. Uh, you know, there are very specific sounds of Messiaen because some instruments he never uses. For instance, you will never find a harp in Messiaen because he hates the harp. He finds that's a very tiny instrument, it's not worth it. And uh, the piano on the contrary is really for him something very representative. And so I think that's because, because I, I knew the Dr. Strobel at this time uh, who commissioned the piece for uh, Don Reichingen, uh, that was the Sudwest Commission. And he asked Messiaen, you know, I want this piece for my orchestra. Please, no soloist, no piano. And uh, therefore, so Messiaen, obeyed and uh, wrote this piece so w without, uh, without piano. But I mean, that's not uh, the only feature. I think also, I mean, that was uh, a piece uh, of uh, his most adventurous period, I would like to say. I think also, I mean, uh, if you see the Ta Turangalila symphony, for instance, which is the big orchestral work before, uh, or even uh, the Réveil des Oiseaux, which is also commissioned by, by the Südwestfunk, which is a little before, so maybe 10 years before, something like that. You find that uh, you, you have this uh, quite uh, conventional language in a way, quite a conventional way of developing the music. Uh, and with Konokomi, there is a, an evolution which began in, at the beginning of the 50s with him, maybe as I mean, under the kind of uh, relationship with his students, uh, he was looking for something entirely new. And I think Konokomi is really uh, the achievement of this period.
Thank you.